Okay, um, thanks everyone. And um, next speaker is Jerome Dokic. Thank you very much. And thanks to the organizers as well for this uh, workshop. Um, so fiction is not my topic, uh, neither is literature. So I, I, I belong to the third uh, category here, which is beyond. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I should say uh, to, to infinity and beyond because we we're going to talk about the sublime. So it's... Um, and uh, but I'm glad that Chiara was just before me because I think there are there are connections with um, with uh, uh, interest in the terrible beauty, uh, the example that she she discussed uh, earlier. Okay, so uh, it's not working, but I can, I can use. No, no, it's fine. Okay, so that's the plan, I mean, very simple plan. So I will talk a little bit about this uh, concept of uh, disinterestedness that um, is associated with uh, aesthetic experience. Then I will talk about the experience of the sublime, just because I'm involved in a research project, I'm running a research project with psychologists actually on the sublime. Uh, and in the third section, I will uh, you know, ask whether the experience of the sublime uh, uh, can and should be uh, dis described as a dis disinterested uh, experience. And then I will conclude uh, and um, say a few things about uh, uh, prospects. Does it work? Okay, and that's the first uh, section. So as you probably uh, all know, I mean, uh, philosophers, but also psychologists actually have been uh, asking whether there's a defining or at least uh, a characteristic uh, feature of aesthetic experience, as opposed to uh, other kinds of experience, ordinary experiences, for instance. And, you know, the traditional uh, answer associated with uh, Kant, but with very many different uh, specific uh, proposals, uh, is that aesthetic experience is, in some sense, disinterested. And when an experience is disinterested, its object is uh, apprehended or represented for its own sake or as it is. So these are, are phrases that you, you can uh, read very often in the, uh, the, 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 the philosophers um, uh, discussing uh, the notion of disinterestedness. So here are, I mean, two examples in Kant's uh, own words, a very famous uh, Passage, so I quote, only liking involved in taste for the beautiful is disinterested and free, since we are not compelled to give our approval by any interest, whether of sense or of uh, reason, that's from the critic of judgment. But many present day accounts of aesthetic experience echo uh, Kant's formulation. Here it's uh, Gerald Davinson, uh, but I could have chosen many other writers. Uh, so I quote, he's, he's talking about aesthetic attention, but, but it's, it's, you know, it, aesthetic attention is, is a form of aesthetic experience. By aesthetic attention, says uh, Gerald, uh, let's, let's mean attention focused on an object's perceivable forms and properties for their own sake and in their full individuality apart from the utility of so uh, attending. So beyond this uh, intuitive and maybe, you know, uh, um, perhaps metaphors of, you know, apprehending an object for its own sake or something like that. Can we say something more precise about the notion of interest and disinterest at stake uh, here? We can start with uh, uh, Emily Brady, who uh, suggests that we uh, define uh, disinterestedness as, as follows. So an experience is disinterested when its object, the object of the experience, is not, so it's a negative definition, is not represented in terms of its capacity to satisfy some desire. And I think you, you, we, we can use desire here in, in a broad sense, you know, uh, which uh, includes, uh, you know, any kind of motivation, uh, emotion, uh, or more generally affective experiences. So th this definition excludes uh, uh, the desire for the object as a source of sensory pleasure, liking for the agreeable, which is an interested experience, as well as the desire for, for the object as a means to some practical or utilitarian end. So a liking for the good, as Kant uh, 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 put it, which is also interested. 
then for, from this initial definition, we can uh, we we can put forward maybe two um, reasonable amendments or modifications to the, the definition. Uh, first, we might want to include in the definition desires that are not strictly speaking uh, attributed to the subject. Okay, so for instance, you can represent a beverage, a glass of water, in terms of its capacity to quench uh, thirst, even if you if you don't have the desire to uh, drink drink it because you're not thirsty, for instance. Okay. So my representation of the beverage uh, as in terms of its capacity to quench thirst, thirst is still interested, even though I have no current desire to uh, uh, to drink. The second, I think, reasonable and more, more substantial, but uh, um, equally reasonable amendment, I guess, is uh, the addition, the inclusion of uh, what we, we may call negative interests, okay, which corresponds to representations of the object in terms of its capacity to prevent the satisfaction of some desire. For instance, we can represent a bottomless pit in terms of its capacity to prevent the realization of the desire not to fall in it. So in, in that case, we, we could say that our representation of the bottomless pit is still interested, but the interest here is a negative interest. Okay, so the, the bottomless pit is, uh, you know, uh, we have a, an, an, an aversion uh, uh, with respect to the bottomless pit, so we have a negative interest in that uh, in that object. Which means that we can revise a little bit the definition. Uh, uh, it, now it says uh, that an experience is disinterested when its object is not represented in terms of its capacity to satisfy or to prevent the satisfaction of some desire that the subject may or may not currently have. And the question I want to address now, uh, very briefly, I don't think I will be too long actually, but is whether the, the experience of the sublime can be said to be uh, disinterested in this, uh, in this uh, sense. I mean, other amendments are possible and should be made to uh, this definition. But I mean, for the purposes of this talk, uh, I will, that will be enough. Keep in mind that the notion of desire, I mean, uh, is, is broad enough to include uh, emotion or any kind of motivation that the subject may, uh, may have. Okay, so let me say something about the experience of the sublime. And here I will just summarize a few theoretical uh, Claims that we have made uh, um, in the project I've talked to, talked to you about at the beginning. Um, so we can let, let me briefly uh, characterize the the experience of the sublime in terms of uh, three broad uh, features, if you wish. Uh, the first one is is vastness. So the experience of the sublime is triggered by vastness in some dimension. The relevant dimension includes space and time. So that may be connected to what Kant called uh, the mathematical sublime, but also with, with power, maybe with complexity, alterity. So there are other dimensions. Uh, so the, if you wish, the notion of vastness is abstract enough to cover this dimension. It's not necessarily a spatial vastness. It's not necessarily natural vastness uh, because uh, although nature is an important source of sublimity, it's, uh, uh, as you may know, and this is a controversial issue whether we can have experiences of the sublime only uh, in relation to nature or natural objects. I, I won't talk much about this controversy now, but that's an important controversy. Certainly nature is a perhaps primary source of uh, sublimity, but, but not the, the only one uh, I, would, I would say. But again, I, nothing in what follows actually hangs on this uh, this uh, generous uh, definition of uh, uh, vastness in. So as, as, as far as I'm concerned here, I mean, uh, 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 natural scenarios can be sublime, but also some uh, human creations. Uh, and you may recognize a familiar landmark of this city on the, on the right here. I don't know if it's sublime. I mean, you can discuss this later. Mm -hmm. um, there is vastness, of course, uh, in it, uh, but um, we can talk about that maybe. Okay, so a, a, a second very important feature is uh, 
is, is not a feature of the object, uh, but it's a feature of the experience of the sublime. The experience of the sublime is overwhelming in some sense, okay, in some intuitive sense, but uh, a sense that we can make slightly more precise. So it saturates our cognitive capacities, which can barely cope with what we are facing. So for instance, Joseph Addison uh, said, I quote, our imagination loves to be filled with an object or to grasp at anything that is too big for its capacity. So the sublime has to do with the too much. Okay, so um, it's too big, it's too powerful for me, okay, for my, my uh, capacities. Uh, so I, I can barely understand or I can barely deal with, with what I'm, I, I, am, I am facing. Or Burke uh, said, infinity has a tendency to fill uh, the mind. Okay, we are, we are overwhelmed, we are saturated with uh, the sublime. A third feature, which might not be uh, specific to the sublime, and here I, I think there's a connection to um, Chiara's uh, talk, uh, the experience of the sublime involves mixed feelings. So on the one hand, the sublime triggers uh, negative emotions, a terror in Burke, uh, horror, uh, fear, anxiety, uncertain, uncertainty. Okay, there's of course an issue about the nature of these negative emotions, uh, whether they are quasi emotions or genuine emotions. So we'll come back perhaps to, to that later. But on the other hand, that's a positive experience, the experience of the sublime. Okay, that it, it's uh, something we want to reproduce, maybe, or something we, we value aesthetically at least. So as a whole, the experience of the sublime is a positive uh, valence as, as an aesthetic experience. And uh, for instance, Berg describes, used the, the phrase uh, delightful horror to, to capture this uh, emotional complexity of the experience of the sublime. And Kant talked about uh, a pleasure which is possible only by means of a displeasure. And that's, that's also a, a very telling uh, phrase uh, to capture this uh, emotional complexity. Okay, so we have vastness, overwhelmingness and emotional complexity. But again, I mean, some cases of so-called uh, difficult beauty or, 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 or terrible beauty uh, might also uh, be cases in which we have some emotional complexity. So that might not be specific to, to, the, to the sublime. Now, Sean Gallagher in a recent paper on the sublime uh, described the sublime as unaffordable. Okay, so that's uh, something that you can't associate with an affordance. So what is an affordance? Uh, that's a complicated story, but if you uh, follow Jose Bermudez, for instance, uh, and you think that an affordance is a perceivable instrumental relation, it's a relation between a means to, to an end. Uh, for instance, uh, I can perceive, perceive the chair as, a, as an affordance, so the chair affords a sitting, for instance, even if I don't want to sit, okay? So I can perceive the, the, the affordance even if I don't have any desire to, uh, to sit. And so the claim, Gallagher's claim is that uh, given this uh, very schematic account of uh, affordances, the claim is that the sublime can't be represented as a means to some ends, okay? So that's an interesting uh, thesis, almost true, but that says something about uh, the sublime. The idea is that the sublime is not associated with uh, an ordinary affordance. Um, uh, affording a range of available actions uh, because the sublime overwhelms our mind because we are filled with the sublime. We don't know what to do with it. Okay, We're at a loss uh, with respect to the appropriate action that we should have uh, uh, in face of the sublime. And in a paper with my, my colleague at uh, Jean-Nico Margarita Arcangeli uh, on, on the experience of the sublime, we uh, we suggest, we, we analyzed, we, we gave a definition of uh, overwhelmingness in terms of the notion of a radical limit experience. So we, we, we have a lot of, you know, limit experience uh, with respect to perception. For instance, when I hear a very high notes, okay, so at the at the limits of my uh, auditory capacities, I can have a limit experience with respect to audition. That is, I know that it's the highest notes that I, 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 I can't barely hear the notes. I have a limit experience with respect to um, 
uh, to uh, auditory perception. And a radical limit experience would be a limit experience with respect to all the cognitive capacities that we have to, to deal uh, with the world. world. So not only perception, not only imagination, but maybe our ordinary way, ways of dealing and coping uh, with the world. That's what, what we feel at least, okay? We feel that we've reached the limits of our ordinary ways of dealing and coping with the world. So that's, that's what, what, why it's called a radical limit experience. It's not just an ordinary limit experience, but it's a limit experience with respect to all the cognitive capacities that we have to deal with the world. So the sublime is experienced as something that is cognitively incommensurable, if you wish. That's a metacognitive experience, okay? It's, it's an experience about the limits of your own uh, cognitive uh, capacities. So strictly speaking, it's a metacognitive uh, uh, feeling or experience. As a controversial example of uh, how the notion of uh, limit experience might, might be used uh, in the context of, uh, of art. So you have, uh, I mean, Anish Kapoor did uh, a few of these uh, similar I mean, installations uh, using uh, this uh, special coating called the Venta Black. I mean, there, there's, there has been a legal issue about the use of this, uh, exclusive use of this coating by, by Kapoor. But, um, the idea is that if you um, see that kind of installation, you might have the feeling that the, the you know that the, actually the hole is uh, is an infinite depth. Of course, you know it's false, but that's the feeling that you might you may have, according to uh, to me at least. And also, I didn't put, but th there's um, a description of this uh, this. Um, Installation by a critic who actually talks about infinite depth, uh, saying that it's the, the, the purpose of this uh, uh, installation to convey the idea of uh, uh, unfathomable. Uh, anyway, if you disagree with that, it's not important. It's not nature, it's art, but uh, maybe that art can trigger uh, limit experiences as well. Now, limit experiences have a negative valence. I mean, they feel bad, uh, sometimes terribly so, because you feel cognitively vulnerable uh, in front of the world. Okay? You have the feeling that you are too small, you are not powered or gifted enough to deal with the world. Uh, so that's what Tom Cochrane calls a feeling of self-negation. You, you feel small, that uh, the, the, the small self uh, effect of the sublime on us uh, on, on the representation of ourselves so it seems that to us that we can't find comfort in any uh, uh, cognitive competence that would enable us to deal uh, with the world. So we feel expelled from the world, so to speak, because we feel highly cognitively uh, vulnerable. And actually, the, this small self-effect or the, this feeling of self-negation um, has been suggested also by, by uh, psychologists. Uh, there are methodological issues about this study, which is a newer scientific study. Uh, we can talk about that uh, if you wish, but I, I still mention this study because I think it's the first uh, neuroscientific uh, study about the differences between the experience of the sublime uh, and the experience of the beautiful. And the, the authors explicitly say that uh, the experience of the sublime uh, is accompanied by what they call a suppression of self-awareness uh, in the brain. So in, in red, you have uh, regions that are um, activated during uh, so-called sublimity experiences, but there are methodological issues about that. Uh, and these regions have to do with uh, what we now call the default mode network, if you, which, which is a very trendy uh, uh, notion in your science uh, now, but it's connected to self-awareness uh, or, or at least the experience of self-relevance, something which you evaluate as uh, relevant to yourself somehow in some, in, some, in some way. So in the case of beauty, you have a, an hyperactivation of these regions. In the case, case of sublimity, you have a hypoactivation of these uh, regions. And actually in the project, we didn't do neuroscience because we the psychologists I'm working with are neuroscientists, but we didn't have time to do a neuroscience, but we have uh, studies that are actually congenial to, to, this, um, to, to these studies, uh, psychophysiological and subjective uh, studies. Anyway, 
but but now the notion of affordance and interest come a part of this point because if we say that uh, you know the radical limit experience that is at the heart of the experience of the sublime as a negative valence i mean feels bad uh, it means that you have a negative interest in the sublime after all uh, so we have a strong negative interest to reduce or suppress the cognitive threat but we don't know how to do so uh, how to do this so we lack an appropriate instrumental uh, relation. Okay, so the sublime may well be uh, uh, unaffordable, uh, as uh, Sean Gallagher uh, puts it, but still the expense of the sublime seems to have a negative, uh, very uh, important uh, negative uh, components to it. And we can characterize further this uh, negative interest uh, in relation to the sublime by um, using this notion uh, of. Um, a need for accommodation. Okay, so uh, I borrow this notion from, I mean, it's, it's a Piagetian notion, which I borrow from Keltner and Aid. I think one of these authors was mentioned yesterday as well. Uh, these are, you know, social psychologists. Um, and uh, they, they, this study, which is a bit old, but it's, I think, the first systematic study about uh, O, A W E, I mean, which is associated with uh, the sublime. And they use the distinction between assimilation and accommodation, which are two ways of dealing with a novel uh, experience or a novel uh, stimulus. Uh, you can assimilate the, the, the object of this uh, new experience uh, if you already have uh, the, the, the relevant mental st structures and, and categories and schemas. Uh, but sometimes you can't do that. So there's a failure of assimilation. And then you have to accommodate, that is, you have to um, uh, cognitively transform yourself, and that uh, requires a creative use of thought and uh, imagination. Uh, for instance, mental, mental models, uh, in the case of the sublime, that enable us to make sense of infinity. So th there's a tight connection between uh, the sublime and the experience of the sublime, and O and E. Uh, that's a table from uh, Keltner and Eight's uh, seminal uh, paper about uh, O. And as you can see here, they define O by two central features, uh, vastness. Vastness it, it means experience of vastness. And accommodation means need for accommodation. Okay, so you feel the need to accommodate something that is too vast to assimilate. That's, that's the, 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 the idea. So you, you have O, according to these authors, when you have, I mean, both vastness and a, and a need for accommodation, ex experience of vastness and need for, for accommodation. And I circled here, you know, uh, elicitors, that, that is objects of uh, O that bear an obvious connection to uh, the sublime. I mean, tornadoes, uh, uh, grand vistas, uh, cathedrals, and uh, so on and so forth even intellectual uh, objects like grand uh, theories, uh, which can be uh, uh, sublime according at least to some uh, authors. So the experience of the sublime involves or uh, involves both the experience of vastness and the need for accommodation, but also, I, I think, or we think, uh, uh, also characteristic characteristic way of accommodating a radical limit experience. So O is a component, I think, uh, or at least, at least shares some components with the experience of the sublime. But we have an aesthetic experience when, when we have, you know, a specific way of accommodating what can't be assimilated. Uh, and and, and uh, that's the reason we, we have talked of, of aesthetic accommodation as what, you know, uh, sets the experience of the sublime apart from other cases of O, including religious and mystical uh, O. I can't go into, into much details here, but the idea is that you can have a radical limit experience. Okay, you can, you can feel that you're losing your cognitive foothold, and that creates a need for accommodation. Yeah. So that, that <laughs> creates the needs to find the new mental schemas, mental categories to to deal with what you are experiencing, which is radically novel. If you don't accommodate, if you don't accommodate at all, may maybe you have, maybe you will end up being slightly derealized with respect to what you are experiencing. That's not real, something like that. Okay, you have 
you, you take a distance with what your experience is. But if you accommodate, you can perhaps you can accommodate by bringing in some concept of God. Uh, uh, not in the case of Julia and myself, but uh, you might. Uh, so you, you could have mystical accommodation uh, and you, you could have aesthetic accommodation. And the, the point is that maybe the notion of disinterestedness might, might you know, play a role in uh, sp characterizing uh, aesthetic accommodation as opposed to uh, other kinds of accommodation. So that's... Um, that's from, from Margheta and, uh, uh, and I, and myself, the paper. Um, unfortunately, the, the reference, I mean, to advertise the paper is obscured by this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I understand that advertisement is, is, um, is forbidden. Uh, okay, thank you. <laughs> so, so we emphasized, if you wish, the dynamic uh, dimension of the expanse of the sublime. Okay, so it's not really a sequence of uh, you know discrete events. You have various feedback loops. Uh, you can have all together, or you can have uh, you know you know multi-stable experiences. But you have these components. We we argued. I mean, we have an assimilation failure. You have something radical in you. You have a metacognitive awareness. I realize that I can't deal with what I'm experiencing. I may have a feeling of self-negation. I'm, I'm too small, not powered enough to, 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 to deal with the world. But then we have aesthetic accommodation, which is a way of, you know, in a certain sense, uh, compensating with, uh, for, for this uh, negative uh, experience. So in the paper, we didn't use the notion of disinterestedness and uh, to, to, to conclude, um, um, I will ask whether, I mean, this is an interesting, if I can say so, uh, uh, a notion to, to, to explain uh, what aesthetic accommodation is. But, that, but, but here we have a puzzle, uh, as it should be clear, I hope, I mean, uh, which is that uh, an essential component of the experience of the sublime is interested, at least considered in itself. Okay, so be, why? Because it involves representing the sublime in terms of its capacity to prevent the satisfaction of the existential desire to cope with the world. So I think it, it falls under the, the, the idea that you have a negative interest uh, in uh, the sublime. But then how could the, the, the whole experience itself be uh, disinterested? So that's, that's, the, that's the puzzle. A first distinction that we might want to, to draw uh, is between, you know, the state of disinterestedness uh, and the process of uh, disengage, dis disengaging ourselves uh, from the object or from any interest we might have uh, for uh, the object. Uh, I, I call the, the process disinterestingness, but I understand it works better in French than, than in English, because in French we, we can say désintéressement, uh, to, to name the process, a désintérêt to name the, the, the state. Uh, it might work in English. I'm not a native, as you can hear, I'm not a native speaker of English, but any, uh, I'm not interested in the terms, but in the distinction between the state itself and the process. So we, we might, you know, approach disinterestedness, disinterestedness in terms of, uh, so to speak, the a kind of assumption asymptotic limit of uh, a process of, you know, freeing ourselves from any interest we might have uh, with respect to the object. And when, and this process of disinterestingness uh, can proceed in, in, in two ways. You, you just you know, get rid of your expense of interest or you re-evaluate or recontextualize recontextualize it. Uh, so you put it in perspective, so to speak. And uh, so that it does not indicate a genuine interest, uh, for instance. Uh, and I think the aesthetic experience of the sublime might involve the, the second uh, way. Why? Because aesthetic accommodation, whatever it is in detail, and what I'm going to say about that will be a bit disappointing because I don't, I, I don't um, have the, the time and, and perhaps uh, I'm not, not sure about what I want to say about aesthetic accommodation, but 
certainly what I want to say about, that, about it, I mean, the, the, the minimal, minimal parts I want to say about aesthetic accommodation is that it, it requires a finding in ourselves novel cognitive resources to deal with the sublime. And, and so it leads to reevaluating the radical limit experience as an illusion. Okay, so we feel that we are losing uh, our cognitive foothold, but we are wrong actually, because we have, after all, the cognitive resources to deal with uh, the sublime. So we realize that we are not so cognitively vulnerable after all. And I think if you, if you, if you, if you see disinterestedness as the result of a process, uh, rather than as a, as a kind of static, uh, affective left, less uh, state, then, then I think you, you will be less exposed to a very famous objection. I mean, the, the no blank stare, the, the, the blank co-like stare objection, uh, due to uh, George uh, Dickey, a very famous objection against uh, this idea of disinterestedness. In a nutshell, I mean, the idea is that uh, disinterestedness uh, is uh, passive, uh, affectless, emotionless, whereas uh, aesthetic experience is engaged, situated, I mean, uh, bringing many of our values and so on and so forth. But, but then if you see disinterestedness as the, you know, the attempt to free yourself from your desiderative emotional affective dispositions, then... Uh, of course, disinterestedness uh, can only be achieved by taking into account your initial emotional response to, to the object, and there's no uh, other way. Now, the affective response itself could persist as an affective experience, okay? Even if you've, if you've already accommodated, so to speak, because, uh, because we have mental models of infinity, because we have scientific knowledge about uh, the, the universe or about the Alps, or we have knowledge about the way uh, Anish Kapoor's uh, artwork is, has been designed. Uh, we know that it uses some kind of coating and so on and so forth. We, we bring in this, this knowledge uh, uh, to uh, reevaluate uh, the limit experience that we might uh, enjoy, we, we might um, have uh, when seeing the, the artwork, for instance. Uh, but still, you know, the initial emotional negative response might persist. I mean, you might be just, uh, you know, horrified by, by, by this. Uh, unfathomable uh, uh, whole, okay? So because of modularity effects, I mean, this, this affective response may persist, even though actually you've already uh, accommodated. Well, that, that's, I can't say more about that, but that's an issue that we've been talking about in the project, which is uh, whether we, I mean, the, the sublime can be boring if you, you know, if you, uh, you face, you, you, Every summer I go in the Swiss Alps to, to have this, this kind of experience. Sometimes I have, sometimes I don't. Uh, but can, can I be bored with that? Okay, maybe I, I can just judge that it's uh, sublime, but I, I don't have the experience anymore. But then there are modularity effects. I mean, you, you still have this, um, the feeling that uh, you are at a loss. I mean, dealing with that, even though you, you, you know better actually about uh, the nature of what you're experiencing. Then the, the response may persist as an affective experience, but it's no longer considered to indicate a genuine interest in the object. So I'm, I'm not, it feels to me as if I'm, you know, I can't do anything with uh, what I'm experiencing, but, but, uh, but, but I know, I, I know better. So. I think I can pass that, but the idea would be that if you, you have some notion of disinterestedness, maybe you can say something about, you know, uh, what uh, differentiates aesthetic accommodations from, uh, you know, other kinds of accommodation. Uh, for instance, maybe I start with mystical accommodation. Mystical accommodation, maybe it's, I mean, it depends, of course, on what you understand by a mystical experience. Uh, but for instance, Gerald Levinson suggests that aesthetic experience is not like a mystical experience because uh, aesthetic experience is a dualistic experience. It's, it's an experience that preserves in experience, in the experience, some distinction between subject and object. Okay. Whereas mystical experiences, according to Levinson uh, and according to other authors, uh, you know, might involve what is uh, sometimes called ego dissolution. So, the oceanic feeling, for instance. So there's no distinction in the experience between subject and object. All is, you know, assimilated in, in, in some, in some way. 
but of course, disinterested is a dualistic experience. I mean, because you, you're, you're trying to, to, to capture the object as it is. Okay. So it's very important that the subject remains, uh, in the background, so to speak, to, to, to have this kind of, uh, attitude or stance towards the, the object. So it's not ego dissolution. You have to preserve somehow the, the subject contemplating the, the, the aesthetic uh, object. And in contrast to religious accommodation, maybe uh, disinterestedness. Uh, I mean, some people say that aesthetic accommodation involves, uh, that's a metaphor, of course, uh, rising up at the height of the sublime, not below. Uh, perhaps, at least in some cases of uh, religious experiences, uh, some cases of religious awe, you might feel that you, of course, you're very small compared to, to God uh, or to some alien uh, that you think has uh, created the... No, okay, I understand sorry, the, the sorry. message. I, I have to, to conclude. No, no, no. no, no okay. So I'm yeah, I've met people. <laughs> Just, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm, I'm kidding. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm almost done, anyway. So in contrast to religious accommodation, uh, aesthetic accommodation involves rising up at the heights of the sublime, not below. I mean, one interpretation of Kant is that the sublime... Aesthetic accommodation involves rising up above the sublime because, of course, it's the mind uh, who is, who is, who is uh, that, that is sublime, uh, and the mind is superior to to nature, for instance. Okay, so you rise up, uh, you, you can rise below the the or, or, or lower below the the eight of the sublime, or maybe you can uh, find a way to. Uh, to, to rise at the height of the sublime. And that, that's actually what uh, Tom Cochrane suggests in his uh, own analysis of uh, the experience of the sublime. His idea, if I can understand him, is that uh, in the end, eventually you find a way to empathize uh, with uh, the sublime object. Okay, That's an object, not, not a person, but there is empathy for object as well. And... Uh, at first, the sublime is anti-empathetic. I mean, you, it's it's something that you can't empathize with, but then you find resources to uh, you know um, empathize somehow or imaginatively identify with the properties of the sublime object. I don't want to defend that. I'm not sure it's it's a correct way of, uh, but I think it's a way of cashing out the metaphor that you rise up to the eight of the sublime, not not below. Okay, so let, let me just uh, conclude. So disinterestedness is best seen as the asymptotic uh, limits of the process of disengaging ourselves from any interest we may have for the object. As such, it's, it, it is not a passive experience of, of state, uh, but on the contrary, it can be, it, it, it can take much effort to remain in this uh, aesthetic uh, stance. So it can be effortful and cognitively demanding, especially in the case of the sublime, which requires accommodating a strongly negative affective response. I mean, the feeling of self-negation self is, is bad, is very, very bad. So that's a very strong negative uh, response. And it's compatible with uh, affective experiences downstream and upstream of it. Okay. Then, I mean, of course, uh, the precise role, and I'm not sure about that, uh, so I will end with these, you know, prospective uh, thoughts. The precise role of disinterestedness in aesthetic ex experience remains to be clarified. Is it itself aesthetic? I mean, is disinterested an aesthetic uh, attitude, stance, or, uh, or, or regime, as my colleague uh, Jean-Marie Schaeffer says? Uh, or is it only an enabling condition of uh, any aesthetic experience? Okay. And if it's an aesthetic experience, uh, disinterestedness, does it involve an evaluation of the object? I mean, can, can, for instance, can it be positive or negative? I think the, the people who actually introduced the notion of disinterestedness uh, to characterize aesthetic experience, I think have been arguing that, uh, or I've been thinking that, uh, that, that uh, disinterestedness is an, an aesthetic, is the aesthetic attitude. It's already aesthetic, not just not just the parts of an aesthetic attitude or enabling condition, but itself. Uh, so contemplation is aesthetic, if you wish. I'm not sure about that. Maybe maybe uh, it's just an enabling condition, and then then you have something like an aesthetic evaluation uh, of the object, which which can be positive or negative. I don't know about that. 
So for instance, and that's my, my last uh, slide, uh, it's interesting, and, and Chiara talked about Kitsch as well, uh, and, and I think Louis about uh, Kundera. Uh, so one, one way of, of looking at things, but I'm not sure about that, is that disinterestedness clears the way for an aesthetic evaluation of the object, which can be uh, positive or negative. And for instance, in some experiences of Kitsch, not all of them, of course, th 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 there's good Kitsch and bad Kitsch, probably. So, uh, so you, you can choose whichever is which. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you, you might say that uh, you know the, the sublime is you know positively evaluated despite an initial aversive response, an initial negative response. Uh, whereas in some cases of kitsch, uh, you, you might have um, a superficial, pleasant uh, response because it's uh, shiny, uh, goldy, uh, glittering, and, and so on and so forth. But then you have a dynamics of evaluation which uh, ends up in uh, perhaps in a negative, uh, in a negative uh, final evaluation of the, the object. And maybe in the case of uh, Jeff Koons, you have uh, even you know a further layer. You might have. Uh, you might have a pleasant response because it's also shiny, goldy, and so on. Then you might understand that. Uh, then you might say, "Well, it's kitsch." Frankly, I mean, that's uh, I don't like it. Okay, but then you can think again, and uh, you can. So, knowledge is important here because you have to know that you know Kunz uh, used the. Uh, uh, so it's 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 delicate uh, craft. So it's uh, you know very special materials, uh, very special uh, uh, work that has been done on this. It's not uh, you know a, a production in series or like 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 the objects above. So you might have, you might have another cycle of uh, you know aesthetic evaluation, uh, and end up with uh, so positive, negative, and then positive again or something something like that. Okay, but even in these cases of Kitsch, you might have some something like disinterestedness. So you have to get uh, to reevaluate your initial pleasant uh, response to to clear the way for, from for an uh, unbiased uh, aesthetic evaluation of uh, the object. And I think it's uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks.